Hello lovelies, in this video the brilliant Dr. Adil is going to be looking at sensory receptors for your A-level biology. Now there are lots of different receptors in this video so be really careful you don't mix the names up or the functions up or the structures up or what goes where. There's a lot to concentrate on in this. If you want to make sure that you are really, really focused in your vision then over my website there are loads of questions to help you. So we're going to start looking at the nervous system and nervous responses. So we've had a look at tropisms and taxis and kinesis, but this is now talking about actual physical electrical signal responses in the body. Sensor receptors are specialised cells that can detect stimuli, changes in the environment. Most are transducers as they convert one form of energy into electrical energy in the form of a nerve impulse. So the electrical energy is a nerve impulse. We're changing one type of energy into electrical energy and some others just detect the presence of chemicals. So first example, you've got your ear, your stimulus is going to be sound changes or changes to the air vibrating and then you've got receptors in your cochlea which is that kind of snail-like shaped coiled part and what they're going to do is obviously change that movement because it is kinetic energy vibrating the eardrum. So the air vibrations cause the eardrum to move, so it's kinetic energy into electrical energy. And that becomes the nervous signal that gets sent down uh, the nerve into your, your auditory nerve into your brain. Okay, so let's have a look at the skin. There's loads of receptors in the skin that detect all sorts of different things. Here's just two examples. So temperature is one of them. We have some very fine nerve endings um, that end in very specific temperature receptors. So the stimulus would be change in temperature, mostly heat. There's a different set of receptors for cold. Um, so the stimulus would be change in temperature or increase in temperature. And obviously then it's taking thermal energy and converting it into electrical energy again. So we get an electrical impulse or a nerve impulse traveling down the nerve. Also in the skin, we have pressure receptors. So the stimulus is pressure, and which is obviously another type of movement. So pushing down onto the skin, um, not lightly, there's light sense touch for that, but this is sort of like pushing down, pressing down the skin. That's detected by receptors called uh, Pacinian corpuscles. And we're gonna have a look in more detail at that in a minute. Um, but that receptor is obviously taking movement, so it's being moved or pressed and turning it into electrical energy as well. Hopefully you remember this one from GCSE. So there are stretch receptors in your muscles. So the stimulus is stretching or the muscle moving, um, stretching or then opposite to contracting, obviously. And they are found in the skeletal muscle and they are going to respond to movement again. So it's, it's another type of kinetic energy being transferred into electrical energy. So it's the spindle fibers or the muscle spindles found in your skeletal muscle. They will be stretched when the muscle stretches and that movement, that kinetic energy is then turned into electrical energy. Then we have the eye, which is probably the easiest one. So the stimulus is gonna be a change in light intensity. Try and remember that stimulus, um, a stimulus or stimuli are changes to the environment. So it's not just the stimulus and just light. It's a change in the light intensity that then is um, registered and triggers a response. So getting lighter, brighter or darker is going to cause the receptors at the back of the eye found in the retina. So these are rods and cones and they're types of receptor cell. We are going to look in a lot more detail at those and how they work in the next video. And they're going to detect changes in light intensity and they're going to take that light energy and turn it into electrical signals again. And then finally, the examples we've got here are the ones where there isn't an energy transfer happening. They are just detecting particles or chemicals. So in the nose, you have your olfactory cells um, when you breathe in in your nasal passages. And then you have receptors in the taste buds on your tongue. These both detect chemicals, either in the air or chemicals in food and substances that you put in your mouth. They are then, basically what happens is the molecules bind to receptors in these cells 
and they then trigger the impulse. There is a great section on this because it's actually a bit more complicated than that. It turns out it's to do with how the frequency of the particles resonate and vibrate, what frequency they vibrate at. That can be detected by these sensors, especially in the nose. And it's a lot to do with physics. And if you want to look more of it, I highly recommend it. But it, it goes into kind of quantum physics about explaining how different chemicals trigger the kind of responses and the, the memories and other things like that that they do when you kind of smell things and how we know that that smell is that smell. It's very interesting. Okay, so we need to think about and be able to explain how these sort of changes in a stimulus actually then leads to an electrical signal. Or what we mean here is like a change in ion movement. And that change in ion movement creates a, an electrochemical gradient. So what we mean is that well, the main way you to describe it is potential difference. So in the same way we talk about voltage, so when there's a potential difference in charge across the membrane, so we've got more positive and more negative either side of the membrane, the cell membrane of the neuron, then we have a potential difference. So that's a voltage. And remember, charge is carried by ions that can move. And so that's, that counts as electricity. So in this example, we've got the cell membrane of a neuron. We've got just a small section of it. The outside is more positive at the moment. It has a greater positive charge because there's more positive ions outside. And the inside is more negative then. It has more negative ions or fewer positive ions inside. And so it's about minus 65 millivolts is the potential difference across this membrane. We've got potassium channels, sodium channels, and then the sodium potassium pump. These are obviously all um, ion channels that are used to allow charged particles to move across the membrane. And when we're at resting potential, which is when no stimulus is happening, this is just the resting state, the neuron, the sodium channels and the potassium channels are both closed. And just the sodium potassium pump is working as normally as it would using some energy to move three sodium ions out for every two potassium ions in. So overall, we are moving out more positive ions than are being moved in. So three sodium are going out, two potassium are coming in. So that gives us and helps us to maintain that overall difference in the membrane where there's more negative inside and more positive outside. Or we can say more positive outside, less positive inside. And then that helps us to remember where there's more positive ions. OK, so then what happens when the stimulus is detected? So the first the, the stimulus starts to happen and it first starts to be detected by the receptors. We start creating what we call a generator potential. So you'll see here we've gone from minus 65 millivolts to about zero millivolts. So that means we've got more positive or we've got less negative. And the way that works is that sodium channels are opened somehow by the receptor. So the, res the, the stimulus is detected by the receptor and that opens or leads to the opening of sodium channels. So more positive ions are coming in. So the inside of our neuron cell, the inside of the membrane becomes more positive. And that's how we get from minus 65 up to zero. So basically it means that we end up being about the same either side of the membrane. And the sodium ions, remember, have stopped being from being coming in up until this point because their channels were closed. So by allowing them in, they're just diffusing in down their gradient because there's a lot more of them outside than inside currently. So they're just going to diffuse in until we get equal. And then we move on to the action potential itself. So once we get to a point where we've potentially created a large enough stimulus to get over the threshold value. So the threshold, the generated potential has to be high enough and there has to be enough depolarization to get above the threshold value, which if we got to zero, we definitely would. And you can see the threshold on the graph down on the bottom right. So if we reach this stimulus 
of the threshold potential because the stimulus is strong enough and enough depolarization of the membrane has happened, then even more sodium channels will open and even more sodium will diffuse in. Sometimes we say it's an influx of sodium because it just means there's so many sodium ions coming in to the cell, the nerve cell. So that means our membrane potential has passed the threshold level, even more sodium channels open, the membrane depolarizes even further, and then what happens is those sodium ions diffuse across. They diffuse to the right or to the left, depending on which way the signal is traveling. They will diffuse along inside the cytoplasm of the cell and create generator potentials further down by making the membrane potential um, depolarize as it goes down the neuron. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail when we look at nerve structure and how that happens. But the point is, is that once this action potential has started, if the threshold value is met, it, it just goes and we, we can't stop it at that point. So then we have to repolarize. So we have to return back to our resting potential by repolarizing the membrane, which basically just means the excessive positive ions are removed and we get back down to being down below about minus 50, minus 65. And we've gone from plus 40 at this point. So we've had such an influx of sodium during the action potential that we've gone all the way to plus 40 millivolts. Very, 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 very positive. And now we need to get back to minus 65. So to do that, we have to open the potassium channels and we close the sodium channels so we don't let them diffuse back in. And the sodium potassium pump gets back to work putting out three sodium ions for every two potassium ions that are coming in. And then the potassium ions are also able to diffuse out of their own channels down the diffusion gradient. So they're able to just leave. So in total, that means we're kind of pumping out and diffusing out more positive ions than we are keeping. And so that works to eventually make our membrane potential go back down to about minus 65. And the important thing here is to note that obviously the sodium channels are closed. So at the peak of the action potential around three on the graph down the bottom, the sodium channels will close and the potassium channels will open. And then that will allow us to start getting back to resting potential. OK, so this is something we have to learn, this sequence, this order. We need to know how resting potential is maintained through the sodium potassium pump and which ion channels are open and closed. and for each stage and be able to describe what happens. And this graph, you might be able to match it to the graph or you might need to look at it as the diagram. Sometimes I've seen it as a table where you've got open, closed, open, closed, depending on which um, ion channel you're talking about. Um, or it could just be the membrane potential numbers. So minus 65, zero, plus 40. But the other thing to know is that this action potential is an all or nothing response. So it's the same size. It always goes from about minus 65 to plus 40. It's never any higher than plus 40. And then it goes back down again. And it will always happen if the threshold is reached. So like I said, if we get past the threshold, there's no stopping it. It will happen. And an action potential will travel along the neuron. If the stimulus is too weak and we don't reach the threshold, it won't happen. So it is either it will happen because the threshold has been reached or the signal's too weak. It will not happen. There isn't an in-between and there isn't kind of a stronger action potential or a weaker action potential. There is no such thing as that. They're always the same in terms of the change in membrane potential. It's just about whether or not the threshold is reached by the generator potential. And if it is, great, then an action potential happens. If it's not, then the membrane potential just goes back down to resting potential and we don't have an action potential traveling along the nerve cell. Okay, so I said we'd look at the Pacinian corpuscle as an example of a receptor, how it works, how it causes this generator potential, which leads to an action potential. So the receptor um, example is, this one is found in the skin, quite deep in the skin, and also in some joints as well. It's a mechanoreceptor, which is another way of saying it responds to movement or kinetic energy, like we said. And it's attached to a single sensory neuron, which will then link up and join up with others potentially to pass on the signal. So 
it's still a neuron like we've seen in GCSE. So it still has an axon, which is the long, thin part in the middle. It has myelin sheaths out around the outside. We'll talk about those as well in more detail when we look at nerve structure, but it insulates the nerve cell. And then we have the neuron or the nerve ending at the center of this kind of whirl of layers of connective tissue. They're called lamellae. We've seen the word lamellae before. It's just use a word used to describe layers of things. In this case, layers of connective tissue kind of round and round and layered on top of each other to create this kind of circular kind of oval shape of layers of tissue. Um, there's gel between those layers as well, um, which helps with the transport of ions between them, which will make sense in a second. And then on the um, actual kind of micrograph, you can see at the bottom, you can kind of see these little dots. They kind of look like nuclei, but these aren't individual cells. They're kind of, they're called fibroblasts. They are the parts that are secreting these connective tissue layers. So that's the kind of structure and what it looks like and how to identify it. And you'll see down the bottom, we've got that micrograph. That is a cross section. And you'll see that the outermost layer is very thick and darker than the others. That is sometimes called the capsule. So the very outermost layer of uh, the Pacinian corpus is called the capsule. And then this is quite circular, this image, because actually this is a cross section. So you're looking down at the top of a cross through. So that very, very central part is the axon that's been sort of cut through um, horizontally. And that's what we're looking at there. So it doesn't look like that oval shape, like my diagram. OK, so think about how this impulse is generated by the receptor. So a pressure stimulus pushes on the lamellae, which deforms the membrane of the sensory neuron. So you can see I've got to redraw my diagram with these layers that have been pushed down, deformed, pressed down, which is what happens when the pressure is applied. And this opens stretch mediated sodium ion channels, which is basically saying that when the membrane's pushed, that physical kind of pushing, pressing, moving of the membrane, stretching of the membrane, literally when it's stretched, they kind of push open or pull open those sodium ion channels, and that's how they open. So that force, is going to physically open the sodium ion channels, which causes the influx of sodium ions, and they sort of push, um, they rush into the cytoplasm of the neuron cell, the axon in the middle. So at that point where it is depressed, that is going to cause depolarization of the membrane, and then hopefully a generator potential. And the greater the pressure, so the more areas of these lamellae that are pressed down and pushed down. The more membranes going to going to get deformed and stretched, the more sodium channels will open, and that makes sense because if you're going to deform more membrane or push or stretch more membrane, more of the channels will be pushed or pulled open, and therefore you're going to get more sodium coming in, which means we're more likely to get a thresh meet the threshold potential and cause an action potential, and if an action potential is then generated, the impulse is going to move down the neuron in this where it's got it in this direction here, so down and away from the receptor, and then it will join up and link up, and that signal will be re received as pressure being um, pushed out. Okay, so I sort of said this already, but all action potentials cause the same changes in the membrane potential, so from about minus 65, minus 70 to plus 40. So it's not how strong the initial stimulus is. So one stimulus, one I don't know, flash of light or one press down is not, and like how strong that is or how bright the light is, is not going to increase the size of the action potential because that can't be changed. It's how frequent the action potentials are. So if the action potentials continue to fire, 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 because the stimulus keeps repeatedly triggering an action potential, then that's going to increase the strength of the signal that's received. Um, and that's how it works. It's not to do with the sort of um, size, it's to do with the frequency. So 
This threshold, whether it's met or not, can be changed and that's done through something called habituation. So animals in particular can be habituated to a stimulus, which means they become used to a repeated stimulus and they stop reacting to it. This because the threat threshold has been raised to prevent action potentials being fired for things that have no importance or value. So initially it could be something that could scare and then they realise that actually there's no danger behind it and what is happening isn't scary or isn't going to actually put them in any harm and so they stop reacting to that. But initially they're not sure so they have a, a fight or flight response and then that decreases over time when they realise the same thing happens and they're not in any danger. Um, it could also be something like a positive example. So if they keep doing things and they're not actually getting a reward or a treat, then they stop responding to that as well. So you can notice this yourself uh, with your clothes, for example, or if you wear a watch or you wear jewellery every day all the time, then you'll no longer really feel or notice that it's there. It's not unless it's rubbing against your skin for some reason or if you put on a new scratchy jumper or something, you might notice it. But the things you wear constantly aren't really bothering you. You're not flinching or moving around because of them. But you can, and you're often very aware of a very small insect crawling on you somewhere. And sometimes you can imagine that feeling. But that means that it's because you're kind of um, habituated to the feeling of your clothes and that sensitivity level has been sort of reached to the point where the threshold has been raised. So that doesn't trigger a response anymore. But something else that is new, a feeling new or triggers above that threshold will then trigger a response to like panic or trying to brush something off you or feeling of like prickling or something. Equally, constantly uh, background noises. So if you live somewhere where there's constant noise, often people who live near train um, lines or motorways or under flight paths and things like that, eventually, because the noise is fairly kind of constant, you don't react to them as strongly as you did initially. Um, and you might not even notice them eventually, but then a sudden loud noise like thunder or something that's unexpected will cause the same kind of jump response as well. And then another one that can be done a little um, sort of, you can do this with humans and, and test the kind of habituation of the kind of gentle light touch response, but you can also do it with animals, including snails. So you can get a small cotton bud and you can touch it just between uh, the point between their eyes on their head. And initially, obviously the first time that happens, they will retreat into their shell and their eye stalks will just retreat as well. But if once they come out again, you touch them again gently, again, they will probably retreat. But if you do this enough times and you're just gently tapping them on, on the face, you'll notice that eventually the eye stalks don't actually pull in and they don't withdraw. They just have got used to that touch stimulus on their face and they don't see it as a threat. And so they stop re reacting to it. And so they've become habituated to it. If you then left that snail for a long time and came back and did it again, they probably would go back to retreating into their shell. It's not necessarily a long term learned behavior, but you can see how that um, their body is tuning out and not firing action potential every single time that they get touched eventually. That is sensory receptors and how they work and some examples. We're going to look in more detail at a lot of parts of this, like how the action potential was generated. Um, we're going to look at sensory receptors in the eye as well. And so we'll come back to a lot of this throughout this topic. But hopefully that was a start um, as a good introduction. Ouch! This is why in some videos I've had explained scratches. <laughs>